on our website. So I know. Yeah. It, it, Great. All right. Well, welcome back. Um, we're at House Transportation Committee after our morning, our mid morning break. Um, we are, um, we have our uh, guests today. We have Gary Holloway, um, who's with the downtown program manager, um, who runs the downtown transportation fund program um, and uh, our the <coughs> transportation budget um, supports this work. Um, and so we're, we wanted to. Um, get us overview. I'm hoping Gary said you're going to give us like a little bit overview of the program and then um, and speak to the um, the budget uh, request that's in that's in the governance proposed but, uh, budget request. So welcome to the committee. Thank you. Um, and for the if you can just introduce yourself for the record, um, right. that'd be great. Great. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Gary Holloway. I'm the downtown program manager at the Community Planning and Revitalization Division at the Department of Housing and Community Development. And um, I, I manage the down, designated downtown program for the state, um, as well as what I'm here to talk about today, which is a downtown transportation fund, which is a direct benefit of downtown designation. So I'm going to provide a, a high-level overview and um, uh, kind of a, a couple updates since I met with this committee last uh, in terms of where the funding has been going and what's you know what we've been accomplishing with the program, and happy to answer any questions. I want to get through, but stop me at any point, you know, if you have questions. Great. I will, I'll help manage some of the questions and be on the lookout. Okay. Great. Um, I guess I'll start by saying, you know, this, this program was started at the same time the downtown program was started. Um, the designated downtown programs um, was enacted in the law in 1998. Um, so we're actually in our 25th year of the program. Uh, so the downtown transportation fund was meant to be a direct um, uh, benefit to those uh, communities that are participating in the program to help with their transportation related capital improvement projects. Uh, here's a map that shows you the 24 designated downtowns that we have in the program. Um, we're happy to say that we added our 24th just a couple weeks ago. Hardwick uh, joined, um, um, kind of graduated from the designated village program to a designated downtown uh, program. So. These are the 24 communities that we support through the designated downtown program. And um, as we designate programs, we actually define a geographic boundary um, that allows um, us to incentivize investments within those areas. Um, some programs like the Downtown Transportation Fund, uh, projects can happen you know, just outside of as long as they're serving the downtown area. Uh, so that's an important distinction as opposed to the historic state tax credit program where property is either in or it's out to get the benefits of the uh, benefits of the program. So here's two maps that you can see in Burlington and Bristol that kind of define their designated downtown boundary, which may differ from a local historic boundary or from a uh, from another designated, you know, uh, locally or nationally recognized area. Uh, so downtown transportation fund uh, can help um, support investments in streetscape improvements, um, parking facilities. Um, we've actually done a number of rail um, kind of upgrades yeah, as Amtrak's been doing that in a number of communities around the state in the last five or six years. So we've been able to kind of tag on some of that money for some rail facilities like pedestrian enhancements, uh, wayfinding signage, which is one of the few programs in the state that can actually fund um, wayfinding signage, which is which so it's really helpful. Um, to have the flexibility in this funding to do things like that, street lighting, and some of those kind of other accessories that you might see in transportation, but are more add-on like bike racks and, um, you know, trash cans and bump outs and things, things of that nature. So you'll see downtown transportation fund often tagged on to larger transportation improvement projects um, for items that might otherwise be ineligible with federal money. Um, we, we adjusted um, the downtown transportation fund um, award amount, and I'll talk about the increase in just a moment. But right now, we have we can fund projects up to two hundred thousand uh, dollars in grant funding uh, with a twenty percent local match. Uh, this year, applications were due January thirty first, so we're in our review process now, uh, and the downtown development board will be reviewing and awarding those at their March board meeting this year. Uh, 
projects have two years to get started and three years to complete the project. So it's meant to be, you know, in the transportation world, as you know, these are quick build projects, right? Things that are that can get implemented in relatively short amount of time um, in kind of that two, you know, one to three year time frame. So a couple years ago, um, you know, this committee was involved with, you know, um, um, allocating one time $5 million funding to support um, an increase in the program. You know, historically, when the program first started, we had about, a, you know, a million uh, to $2 million in the early years. And um, in the Great Recession of 2008, that funding was, was slashed um, in half. And so we were operating until 2021 with about a half million dollars in, in funding to support the 24 downtowns. Um, and that's we previously had a cap of $100,000 for projects because we had limited funding. But since we had this one time $5 million allocation, we, as I said, we were able to expand and, um, and increase the cap and reduce the match um, as municipalities are going through you know, some constraints as well with their budgets. Um, and then one of the best things that we were able to accomplish um, for years, designated village centers from our smaller communities wanted to be able to have access to this funding. And so with that opportunity to have the one-time increase, we were able to expand um, to eligible designated village centers. And I'll outline what eligible means in just a moment. Um, as you'll see in 2022 and 2023, we've had a pretty, um, you know, robust request um, for funding, um, and fortunately been able to fund a lot of um, both downtowns and village centers in the last two years. And Chair, just one quick question. Yeah. So the, the 2022 and 2023 allocations <clears throat> will be out of that $5 million? Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. And you, uh, yeah. so we also have the annual allocation. That's what I was going to ask. Yes. Yeah, so on top of that, there's an annual allocation of um, We'll have the, uh, five, roughly a little half over five, a, a little over half a million dollars. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so eligible for the sake of this kind of one-time increase, and once that five million is gone, then we have to discuss the eligibility again in terms of you know how many communities are are, are eligible to receive the funding. Um, you're going to hear later from Richard um, about the Better Connections program, but it's another program that we run with VTrans. Um, to kind of support kind of land use and transportation planning um, in, in around our, our centers. And so communities that have participated in that Better Connections program are also eligible um, to apply for funding. Um, so you'll see the list here. It's, it's every two years, the Better Connections program will work with, you know, two to three communities and um, they're going through that application process now. and. Like I said, Richard will talk more about that, but we anticipate two to three more communities that will be in the program um, this year, um, and therefore next year would be eligible potentially for upon completion of that Better Connections program. Um, Chittenden County um, is special, and they don't receive um, funding for um, um, the Better Connection program because they have their own transportation dollars in Chittenden County. So because of that, we, we didn't want to punish them, um, but rather uh, we worked with the uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, and we kind of looked at who, which communities had been through um, a similar type process, uh, transportation planning process, and we identified these five communities that had been through that um, in Chittenden County. And we may add to that as they go through their own planning processes. Um, here you'll just see, once again, kind of a snapshot of um, you know, how many, what, what the request was uh, in the last two years um, in supporting 19 downtowns and village centers. Representative Burke has a question. <clears throat> so following up on that funding, so you got the five, <clears throat> five million, whatever, and so these, this three million is part of that. You're drawing down those funds. So there's there's five million dollars that come out of two pots of money. Um, one I think I may have it backwards, but one and a half million is out of um, was out of the T bill, I believe, and three and a half million was out of the. I might have it backwards. One and a half was out of the capital, and three and a half million was out of the T bill. Uh, and then and then in addition to that, we have a regular allocation that we get of the five hundred thousand each right. year. Um, so um, we're drawing down out of that pot of money, and we're going to draw. We're drawing down out of the five million first. Right. Um, if that makes sense. So it's it's going down. Yes. Yeah. And is the the request in for this year in the budget? I, I don't yes, recall. Yes, it is. Five hundred thousand. Yeah. Five hundred thousand. Yeah. It's it's. I, I should have had the exact number. It's five hundred and change. Yeah. Thirty. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yep. 
Okay, may I ask a question here too? So <clears throat> of the requests in the 23 applications, do you have a breakdown of what the village centers versus downtowns is? is yeah, we have on our, and I can share, I can follow up with an email on our on our website. We have a um, kind of a snapshot of funded projects and you'll, you can kind of see um, by calendar year or by community, which communities have received funding and which calendar years. Um, so we can give you kind of, and it kind of has a kind of high level like description of the project and dollar amount. Because for this, this with this $5 million, it was open, it was a wider aperture for village centers, which yep. would normally be just the downtown. That's right. That, I mean, That's right. This is the second year we, in 20, um, 21, um, 22 and 23, we've been able to um, have village centers be part of that. So this is just the second year we're reviewing village centers. And they can have any community can have up to two applications um, active at one time. Um, so they can come from a municipality or from a, a local municipality only. Only. Yeah, and, and often what happens is um, they work with a regional planning commission or they work with a downtown organization with the application, but ultimately the grant sits with the municipality. Mm -hmm. Great, Representative Pouch. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, Chair. Um, <laughs> The, can you go over the Chittenden County designated areas that aren't eligible, why they weren't eligible, and does this bring them into eligibility? I kind of, kind of floated over my head. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so um, communities in Chittenden County are not um, you know, eligible for the Better Connections program. They're eligible for downtown transportation funding if they're a downtown. So Burlington, for example, yeah. is eligible because they're already a downtown. Um, because the, the legislation and the statute was tied to um, the Better Connections program, we can only make communities that had been through that program eligible, but we allowed the, the statute allowed there to be some flexibility to have communities um, who had been through a similar planning process. Um, so we identified these communities by looking at which communities had been through a comprehensive transportation planning process. Um, um, you know, for specific centers, um, for their village center specifically, not just in general of the town. Um, and so we may add to this list of five communities. Um, and we, we do kind of have in the application, we say, if your community believes that they have been through this, please contact us um, so we can talk through that. And if we, if we have missed something, we certainly would want to make them eligible. So once they're on this list, which may be growing, mm -hmm. they're just as eligible as Correct. the other ones. As long as as long as we have this this one time right. money at, at the end of this funding, we will have to dis, you know you all will have to decide you know what the eligibility you know would be if we you know the, the downtown board really makes the determination too of um, in you know in kind of conjunction with whatever is drawn up in statute so. Representative um, Lally. So I'm noticing that Shelburne is not on this list, which is um, not surprising, but um, alarming. Um, so it, uh, if we were to, you know, uh, get on that and uh, participate in something that we believe would be a reasonable facsimile of the Better Connections mm -hmm. funding, is the downtown board the one who makes that decision, that determination that this, yes, Shelburne does qualify, or or, or is, is that done in-house, or how does that work? Um, this is where I'm going with this. Like, yeah. Get on this right away, Shelburne. I'd have to look, I'd have to look closer probably at that, um, that addition of the $5 million to see what kind of flexibility there might be for the downtown board to make that determination, um, or if it's interpreted as once the $5 million is up, um, to go towards the better connection communities if that needs to be revisited again. So I would have to kind of take a closer look and get advice from council to determine if that is a downtown board decision or if that's a decision that we need to be made here. So I'm kind of answering your question, but I'm deferring yeah. it a little bit because I don't have an absolute yeah. answer on that. But, you know highlights the urgency to yeah. get going on this. Right. Which I will communicate back to folks from Shelburne. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Can I ask a quick question about yeah. that along the same lines? Huh? Just about um, the Essex town, like is, is, the, is, is this indicative that like Essex town, for instance, like that there was so, more work done in- So I'm gonna oh, say, go no, no, so I, yeah, it I'll might stop. be, no, I think there are a lot of questions. So Gary, maybe take a minute to talk about like how a, a town gets, um, 
downtown and village designation because i think that's behind some of these questions that yeah uh, so yeah. um if you can do that uh quickly because yeah. uh there's a downtown program and you're also and then there, just for clarification for new newer members there we have this opening of an aperture that in this time period with that additional right. increased funds that village centers were um be made available to village centers as well um and so i think what i'm hearing from members you know who might be representative communities that they don't see their communities on that list so yeah, sure um so I, I imagine many of your communities have designated village center um designation which richard you know administers that program has been able to bring a lot of communities in into that um, which opens up benefits um you can look at it as you know downtown designation is kind of you know like graduating into another you know a higher designation level that opens up more opportunities but there's with that there are more requirements of the municipality what are some of the criteria that you use yeah yeah so um for some of the some of the bigger things to look at when you're looking at downtown designation are does a community have water wastewater capacity for future um kind of expansion from economic development so um if you're going to be you know growing adding housing or adding um um, uh, commercial buildings, you know, do you have that water wastewater capacity? That's one. So we look at that um, and then you have a reserve kind of for that expansion. Um, do you have a kind of a planning commitment that identifies, you know, a design review district or a local historic district um, or a, a local board, um, downtown development board that can oversee local Act 250 review? Do you have those mechanisms in place in your, um, in your municipality? Um, that's a requirement. Um, we require that those those particular planning areas um, are defined um, locally and that um, at minimum um, any of the areas that we would designate in the downtown program would have to also be within those defined um, planning districts um, locally so that's also a bigger a bigger list um, communities need to have a capital improvement budget program um, so they you know specifically around investments around transportation lighting water wastewater um, you know, um, things of that nature. So we know that there's a plan for making those, those investments in the core the commercial core of the downtown. Um, and then the other piece that makes it kind of unique, this program's modeled after Main Street America. Um, you know, as we saw the demise back in the 70s and 80s of, um, of kind of strip malls and malls being developed, um, you know, outside of our centers, we were seeing kind of a um, degradation of, of properties and um, in our downtown, so we, we we are requiring there to be a downtown organization that's a nonprofit organization that works with the municipality that's identified as kind of the um, the downtown official downtown organization that we work closely with um, that kind of fills that community reinvestment agreement, you know, around economic development, around beautification and promotions, around um, you know, kind of the vitality of the downtown. So that having that nonprofit and having funding actually required from the municipality to support that downtown organization is also there. Um, and so those are kind of some of the high level kind of bigger pieces that you would need to have to kind of graduate from a, from a village center that doesn't require those pieces um, to having a downtown. And I'll just ask the community, if you have specific questions about your your town, I think Gary and Richard are both amazing resources, but maybe you can grab them mm -hmm. after the committee or at this, there's a, it's a really terrific program. Yeah. And thanks for your support of it over the years. Um, right, so I'm going to advance um, now just um, additional numbers and you can see some of this in the, um, the one page report that I shared um, in the email as well as some hard copies. Um, you can see over the last um, you know, five years that we've awarded 41 projects in 19 communities. And you can see the leveraging of funding here that we, you know, $6.6 .6 million in investments of downtown transportation funds have really, um, you know, leveraged a lot of other federal, local, private money, uh, $52 million. So it's a good return on investment. And I love this picture. Um, Representative Lamphere, I did this for her last year when um, she was here, and I, you know, this is her community in Bridgens, and Bridgens has just been ticking away at kind of um, these small projects, but they've been made a big difference. And this is an example of kind of like a public-private partnership where uh, the city of Bridgens approached the pro pro uh, property owners and said, we'll do this amount of money, but this is on your property. We can make these ADA accessibility improvements. So they chipped in money that helped with the match, that helped them get the grant. Um, to fund these projects. And they're actually applying for one more accessibility improvement this year um, as well. Um, so they've, Regens has been a great success story in terms of 
beautification and, and pedestrian and accessibility improvements um, in the downtown. <coughs> and now I'm just I'm going to share some um, some of these projects that we funded in the past. Um, St. Albans is another um, you know success <coughs> that we've shared. They've done a number of investments. Um, you know, this is a picture of a you know an outside seating area. We didn't we didn't fund the chairs and the umbrellas. Um, <laughs> Um, but we did fund the, um, the, the hardscape improvements of the bump out to kind of create that more pedestrian feel going out into the street, narrowing, making it a safer crossing. And um, so we've done a lot of kind of sidewalk enhancements, um, extensions um, um, in and around St. Albans downtown area. Um, Bristol had a larger um, federal project at the intersection just behind this picture. Um, that was happening and they as part of that they did some enhancements to their park which was directly adjacent to that uh, intersection so we were able to help support adding the lighting through this um, through this popular park and added some benches and trash cans and um, I think we had a little bit of money at the intersection as well um, and Bristol also uh, did some uh, replacement of pavers and made some sidewalk improvements as well of another yeah, another year that they applied for it um, Brattleboro has, uh, you know, um, done some bike pedestrian improvements. This is a shot outside the co-op, um, you know, and, and making improvements out there, as well as uh, most recently doing some train um, enhancement work in, in the site work around the Amtrak station, which they're really excited to be opening up very soon. Uh, so that's, that's great, great news. Um, and then here's a um, shot of Pulteney. This is for, for, for you, Representative McCoy. Uh, you know, this is a beautiful um, um, park, uh, the Slate Quarry Park in Pulteney. Um, you know, we look at parks as being kind of parking spaces for pedestrians, right? So it's part of the pedestrian system. Um, so we, fortunately, we were able to be flexible enough with this funding to make those pedestrians. Uh, and this was a great kind of nonprofit um, group that helped lead this effort and really put the application in for the municipality and worked with them. Um, and some great aerial photos of this. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to see it in person yet, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's it turned out really nice. Our local area slate. And it's the slate kind of capital in Pulteney, so it kind of celebrates that tradition. Um, Springfield, um, this is a site of an old uh, building that was literally falling into the Black River. Um, and um, through kind of work with historic preservation and a number of other, you know, funding sources, we were able to kind of like analyze the site and realize that it was not a historic resource that was worth saving. And they took the building down and they extended what was like a teeny pocket park into this. Um, and they created just a terrific uh, park along the Black River that opened up the river view from the downtown. They didn't really have a good river view. Even though you were standing right in downtown, you couldn't see it, except for that little pocket park. And it's really expanded it open. Um, and now they use this for, for programming um, in the summer. They've received better uh, places grant, um, you know, on top of the downtown transportation fund um, to do activation and kind of beautification and make this, this space work. Um, and so this was kind of a multi-year phase project that we're able to fund um, in a couple phases, we were able to fund it twice, actually, um, which is terrific. Uh, and I mentioned before that we're able to fund wayfinding signage. Um, and here's an example of a recent project in Rutland um, where they, they did some wayfinding signage in the downtown to direct um, the locals and mostly tourists and travelers through, through Rutland. Um, and then I'll just kind of end with just saying, you know, this program has been, it's been really instrumental in helping support um, um, kind of the efforts for us to revitalize downtowns and it's having the flexibility in this funding um, allows them to be creative and, um, and thoughtful um, and I think you'll see as you're going traveling through a lot of our downtowns um, there's a big difference than if you're traveling through other states their downtowns that mm -hmm. our downtowns really stand out um, and it's because of programs like this that help them support that so I'll end there and I'm happy to take questions that's great, but well, we asked questions along the way, so I don't know if there are hey, additional. Like to, yeah, Representative Shaw. I'd like to change the subject just a little bit here. You did the, uh, you were the responsible for the uh, Volkswagen settlement money charging stations. Uh, you, Not entirely, but I was part of that. <laughs> uh, 
are you prepared to give an update on that, or do we want to have it come out later? I, I would encourage. Um, so to answer your question, yes, I was part of an initially of the interagency steering committee between the Agency of Commerce, uh, VTrans, Public Service Department, um, DC, and Health. The whole, the whole state government. Five, all of us, right? We all kind of stood up that Volkswagen, some of the money for electric vehicle charging supply equipment. Um, so I, I would suggest that you and you know that we invite back my colleague Bronwyn Cook, who is, has since taken over that. Um, the additional funding, um, you know, the ten million dollars that we got in electric vehicle supply equipment. I think she'd be probably better positioned now um, that she's taken over that program to provide an update to this committee on. Um, and I think she has been in here. Yeah, she has been in here already once, and I don't know if there's other aspects. That, Bronwyn? Need to Bronwyn Cook. Right. Well, this is this is this is great. And oh, Representative Burke. Yeah, um, you probably don't have this figure right now, but I'd be interested to know what the what the what what's your remainder? What money is in the pot right now? Well, if you do, yeah, I mean, I can give you like ballpark. I can't give you an exact number, but if you figure we we awarded um, a little over two million dollars last year, yeah. and we have in request one point three million. Um, I don't know how much of that we will award, but yeah. um, you know, if you figure roughly three million dollars. Um, um, subtracted from the five million, so we'd have about two million of that one-time funding, and then whatever balance we would have from the annual allocation of five hundred. Just five hundred and twenty-three thousand nine hundred and sixty-six dollars <laughs> is another. Just trying to get a sense. Yeah, you know, would love to like keep replenishing your largest so that we could include the the um, hundred continue to do that. I mean, I would anticipate that next year could be the last year that we have funding available um, to support the designated village centers uh, and the, and um, in this in this way without new money. And as you can imagine, with 24 downtowns at about $500,000 of funding, if you add 15 to 20 communities, so if you have 40 communities competing for a roughly $500,000, it starts to really dilute how many projects you can fund in a year. So I will kind of emphasize that point, but. Um, Good to know for the future. Right. That, that could be helpful for the committee as a maybe follow up, just to know of the, the funds that have gone out, which like what the, what the, com, what the number of village centers versus downtowns and maybe those, those, the funds. And then sometimes I know that you have like a, 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 a number of grant uh, requests that you receive and how yeah. many you brought. That just might be helpful yeah. for the committee to have a sense of that. Um, I know for this year, you know, with the eight applicants that we have, half of them are village centers and half of them are downtowns. It's an even split. And oh, wow. Last year, it was about, we had 15 applicants and it was about the same. It was about half and half um, in terms of village centers and downtowns. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. All right, if the, unless we have questions, I think we can pivot to Richard Amore and Matt, but are you gonna stick around, Gary and Kate? Cause I'm gonna stick around, yeah. The programs are, have a, a, a little bit yeah. of a lot for us. So um, please. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Uh, Matt, you have your computer, or do you need mine? You got it. Okay. Okay, great. So we're gonna transition. Um, and welcome um, Richard Amore and, and Matthew Aaron Gina. We Matthew has been into the community this year already. And he's also involved with the Better Connections program. As, and, uh, and we get to we get welcome, uh, Richard Amore for the first time. Um, so I, and it's I think it's kind of interesting. No, Matthew is with the Agency of Transportation, and Richard is with the um, Department of Housing and Community Development. So this is a program that um, uh, uh, another collaboration or partnership, um, and we are looking forward to hearing about it. And give you a minute to set up. Yeah, thank you very much. We have some handouts too that I can pass around. Can pass those around. Are in the report. Our representative is sharing the wealth. <laughs> She's celebrating the pocket <laughs> This is the sister <laughs> program that I have. It's two of us as well. Great. Well, welcome. And if you can just start off by identifying yourself for the record, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I'm Matthew Arancio. 
happy to be back here and see you all again. Planning manager at VTrans. Uh, so last time I came to talk about a research grant I was specifically working on. I, as I mentioned, I wear many hats at VTrans. I oversee our transportation planning initiative. I am learning and uh, on board, being onboarded about relations. With you know, and finally, one of my favorite hats, because again, this is a, an interagency effort and partnership. I'm the VTrans planning manager for Better Connections. Thanks, Matthew. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, um, Chair Coffey and the committee for having us this morning. I'm Richard Amore with Agency of Commerce and Community Development. I work in the same team as Gary and Community Planning and Revitalization. I co-manage the Better Connections program with Matthew, as well as oversee the Village Center designation program that we talked about, as well as the Better Places uh, placemaking program. Good to see everyone. Great, welcome. And I'll just give an honorable mention too, uh, and you'll see why later on in this presentation, but you'll see that one of the logos up here is Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, and there's funding that is embedded in this grant, grant program that is provided by them. So I want to give them an honorable mention, even though they're not at the table here today, because they are an important partner as well. And uh, just before we dive into it, I want to joke and say I almost brought my jar, my uh, Urban, ur my urban word uh, quarter jar oh, here. Yes. But I not to, so I will I try to adhere to that. I stick away from the word urban, but um, just to dive into this a little bit, I think um, it's interesting the the order of presentations that you saw here because I came last week to talk about the more data driven side of planning and how data allows us to make uh, decisions as planners. And then you saw the implementation side of planning with Gary and the Downtown Transportation Fund. And this is the in-between space. So I think, you know, it's kind of funny the order that you got because it was a bit mixed up. And ideally that would have been a little bit more linear with uh, the smart growth stuff, this, and then Downtown Transportation Fund. But, you know, we'll work with the order that we got and we're happy to be here today, so. Well, that's good to put us in order. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. so, uh, and it's not by any means correcting the, the, the committee here, but just to say that, that in terms of a planning process, you'll see how this fits in. So. Um, just to provide a brief overview here of where Better Connections came from, and this is before my time. Richard can speak more to this, but uh, this is my part of the presentation, so I will speak about it. Um, you know, uh, what the vision of Better Connections came from a Smart Growth America study in 2013 that recommended Vermont take a more multi multidisciplinary approach to smart growth and planning. And so thinking about the agency resources that we had at the table, at the time, it became clear that the complex problems that the state is dealing with when thinking about uh, environmental issues, the future of growth, absorbing new population, it became clear that a multi-agency and multidisciplinary approach is really the only way to capture and respond to the complexities of the reality that we have today. Um, enter Better Connections. And so you'll see here the program objectives, object, excuse me, objectives of Better Connections. Um, you'll, the three of them are help communities identify and prioritize their goals and projects, develop a roadmap to achieve their goals and move projects forward, and link communities with public and philanthropic partners to implement their priority projects. What this means is that we work with communities who are looking to create a vision for themselves and in many ways renew themselves. Um, certainly as we discussed last, last week at the Smart Growth meeting that Vermont has a lot of great bones. We have a lot of great concentrated village and town center downtowns that that need a little help and that help will be provided via the a better connections program so really what we are looking to do here as part of this and the sweet spot that we have here is the idea of transportation space uh, and economic development providing street life and bringing people back to our downtowns and just as a fun factoid to bring that home here um, Streetscape space within our town centers and within our cities broadly represents about 30% of our public space. So this is a vastly underused public resource that when Gary was speaking about, for example, neck downs, neck downs that are extended pedestrian spaces can just be a pedestrian space, but also can be a public space amenity that can have new life as well. And so really that's the sweet spot of better connections is the economic development that is created by public spaces and streetscape spaces together. So just a little bit of overview about Better Connections in particular. This is a biannual program. Um, so the next cycle will be starting this year, actually. We are anxiously awaiting applications from grantee communities, which are due this Friday. Uh, so we're hoping to have about 10 to 12 communities apply in this grant cycle. Three communities are awarded with every grant cycle. Um, and 
as Gary mentioned uh, in his previous presentation, those communities cannot be within Chittenden County. Chittenden County has its own planning and downtown planning process via the MPO. Um, and really what we're looking for, again, are our villages and towns that are looking to, broadly speaking, re-envision their downtowns and re not just their downtowns, but their connections to regional amenities to support economic development, with, both within the downtown and at the region level. Um, this is a municipality-led project, which means that the municipalities that apply are also their own uh, program managers and project managers, with the option that regional planning commissions can be hired by the municipality to be the project manager. So if there's a technical assistance and support that is required, because oftentimes these municipalities can be quite small, um, as we all know. And so the idea that additional technical assistance and support can be provided by the RPC to make sure that also that planning process coincides with the transportation planning and other regional development planning visions for, um, for that area. And you're, to a certain degree, you're getting right now the pitch that we've given to grantee communities in this cycle as part of our pre-application meeting. So I'll give you some of our, our, um, our words of wisdom that uh, we have given to grantee communities as when they've been thinking about the applications for this cycle. These are big visions, and these are big visions that are meant to encompass problem solving for various aspects. So maybe uh, to give an example, the, the, the town of Rockingham right now is thinking about development on the island at Rockingham, but also a regional trail network. So we suggested that, for example, as part of their application process, they think broadly about those two visions under the umbrella of a vision for their downtown. So maybe each of those individual components, which might have been attacked with one planning process or singular planning processes, come within the umbrella of a better connections project so that each can be considered together and we can think broadly about how transportation connections empower downtowns. Um, Part of this work is consultant management. That means that grantee communities, as part of the grant, typically hire consultants to run their planning process. And so that's an interesting dynamic where grantee communities are, you know, their own project managers and their own project administrators. Um, so that's just a level of complexity within the planning process that really empowers these communities to drive their planning process, but also creates more administrative work. So when thinking about better connections, we always say that this is a, a heavy lift and we encourage communities to think before applying just because of that dynamic of consultant management and administration. Um, community engagement is extremely important. Each Federal Connections project has a technical advisory committee composed of members of the community that are meant to be sounding boards and provide feedback for any of the broad visions and big ideas that are being proposed as part of this project. And finally, and most importantly, there is a lot of agency support to this. This is a, I would say, a not typical grantee program where, uh, you know, Perhaps a grant is awarded, a report is received, and we are all done. Richard and I are intimately involved in each of the planning processes with each of the communities within the Better Connection cycle. We attend monthly meetings with those communities. Well, we have monthly check-ins with those communities. We typically attend their planning meetings. We review any of the documents that are provided by the consultant to provide that extra layer of technical assistance and support where it's needed to really make sure that these visions sign through and not just create a vision, but also create an implementation plan for the future. So Matthew, may I ask a question? So yes. is, am I hearing you, you, you it's a, a grant application that's every other year and there's three, a maximum of three. Is that maximum um, because of funding available or capacity? It sounds like it's a very high touch um, program. So can you speak to that a little bit? Like it is, if more money were to, put in there, would you have greater reach? Would you have the capacity to do that? I think um, it's a combination of the both, to be honest. So the funding source is really uh, adequate and sufficient and best suited for three programs or three communities. And also because of that high touch factor, I would say that uh, absent the ability to uh, duplicate Richard and me, uh, <laughs> you know, it's really important to, the, the quality of better connections is that personal touch, which means that the limit is really, we've seen as three communities as part of this. So Richard, I don't know if you have any additional observations. Yeah, yeah I would just add, um, a couple of years ago, we did a program evaluation and we um, carved off a little funding to hire somebody to help us review the impact of the program in the first few, five years. Because it was a new program, we wanted to kind of get some feedback. We interviewed past awardees and um, looked at internal structures and see how we could make the program better moving forward. Um, Originally, the program was every year. We were funding three communities every year. These are 18-month processes. They're overlapping with each other. 
the super high touch program where we're out in communities working with them, providing a lot of technical assistance plus. Um, it was really hard to do when you had communities overlapping and yet six communities, not three. Um, things were capacity wise, weren't, we weren't able to fill those gaps as much. Um, and so the part of the evaluation said we should go to every other year program. So now it's an every other year program. And I would say, you know, it is a little bit of the funding, but it's more about the capacity and the high touch nature of the program to ensure we can provide that support because it is a lot of um, support at the state level to ensure that the small communities can manage these consultants effectively, engage the community through a robust community engagement process. So these ideas are community driven. When they go out to vote for bonds and makes these implementations happen, they've already had all that community buy-in and support. So it's more likely to, to lead toward implementation. And then we also ground them in funding at the state and federal level to make sure the recommendations aren't just pretty drawings that are inspiring, but are actually grounded on the ground realities with funding. So they will get implemented and they're not um, recommending something that would never be able to be connected through a bike peg grant, for example, or something like that. Um, so the, the, the evaluation, you know, kind of dialed us back to do it every other year. And we've, in the past few rounds, we've seen that be a little bit more effective, especially in our engagement with local communities. Great, thank uh, you. And I, um, to just what Richard says, this is almost a response to Representative Shaw's question from our other meeting where we talked about what is the people factor of this planning process this is the people factor of this planning uh, the planning process and so the data and the numbers that you saw in that first presentation i gave really uh provide the knowledge that then allow us to engage communities to make sure that visions respond to individual populations and needs within those communities so this is the people part right here so to respond to your question i know it's a little late but it's here now today so, <laughs> so hopefully i get an a on that so we'll just <laughs> I think we have another question, Representative Campbell. Yes. Yeah. So, how much of your time is spent on this program, or or, or other people's time? I would say right now about a third of my overall time is spent on this. So, like I said, a third is about the TPI initiative, the transportation planning initiative. A third is the MPO, and a third is this. But it also is seasonal. So, right now, it might be a little bit more like half time, considering the pre-application meetings that we had with each of the ten to twelve communities that are applying as well as I'll get into more of the workload via um, how, the, uh, how the program is broken down in later slides. But it, it, it's seasonal, okay. but it can go close between enough. a half and a third. Or close enough, I think Richard's. I'd say about a quarter, 25%. Yeah. And it, it ebbs and flows. Yeah. And, and the, you know, it's one of those programs, the more we touch the community, you know, the more yeah. I touch it is, the better the project's going to be. Sure. So as, you know, we have more capacity, we can provide more support. When we get overstretched, are there's gaps there. Right. Um, sometimes we try to pull in other team members. You know, Gary's been involved in the past and others. We have some new team members I want to plug in because it's a great time to connect and get to really understand the local issues. So new team, new team members, the great orientation to what's going on on the ground in Vermont communities as well. But you two are mainly, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Great, thanks. Representative Lally. Um, so um, absent the ability to clone the two of you so we could have you know more capacity for this, um, is there, a, um, is there a, a way that you could envision that would maybe what the RPCs could work with, with um, you on this to sort of tee up communities to be able to get in the pipeline easier and faster because um, it, it's, as you say, it's a heavy lift and um, um, it's really important that a community, I would think, leverage this incredible opportunity to the maximum degree. Um, but I can also see, you know, this is exactly what we need. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just wondering if there is a, a uh, if you could imagine, as we, just from a policy standpoint, a, a way to um, think about how um, communities could be sort of made um, better connections ready or something, mm -hmm. for lack yeah. of a better descriptor. Yeah, I'll hop in on that, and Richard, feel free to, but you know, I think uh, the um, the technical assistance that we've been providing, I'll just uh, high level, Richard and I are very good at business development at the side of this to kind of generate interest in this and, you know, attract new communities. A great part of this cycle in particular has been our pre-application meetings because we've been able to talk to communities and hear what it is they want to do and provide feedback for their applications. And, you know, given that there are only three uh, available slots and 10 communities, we've essentially done indirect consulting and support for their planning visions, right? So 
although we might not they, we might not guide them ultimately to a better connections grant, perhaps we've given them some technical assistance and input to shape visions and help them go for other grants or planning opportunities as well, working with the RPCs, for example. So I think we, there's a lot of indirect technical assistance that's provided us by the, the virtue of the conversations that we have with potential grantees. And, yeah, and I would add, RPCs are involved from day one. They're integral to this program. They sit on the review and selection committee to depict the three communities we fund. They're a core component of the local steering committee. So they're integral to the program success. And the, the more the RPCs provide as a support mechanism, just like us, the better the project is. And the ones that have really shown, you know, in the past uh, 18 projects we funded since 2014, the ones that have been the best projects have been with that the regional support mechanisms in play at a high level. Um, another way that we get a lot of this pro or a lot of interest in this program is <clears throat> Vermont Council of Rural Development. They go out to communities like six communities a year and doing community visits. Oftentimes, I don't, I'd say almost 99% of the time, something new with the downtown or village comes up, connecting to recreation, connecting to other assets, and better connections is one of the first things that is a recommendation that they move forward. Because the community visit process is a 30,000 foot high level visioning, getting folks mobilized around a common agenda to move forward instead of direction. And then you need the next step to really ground it in the physical reality of the, the landscape, the, the downtown infrastructure. And that's what better connection kind of comes in and mobilizes them to move forward after they get everybody kind of rallied around the common vision through the VCRD visit. Right, thank you. It's kind of like the pipeline if you're you know, for a community, you go through a community visit process, then you go through a better connections process, then you may go through a scoping and engineering study, and then you go through a bike ped grant to get the project built. So for members who don't know about Vermont Council on Rural Development, <clears throat> a community needs to invite VCRD to come in um, to have conversations, and then you decide if you're gonna move through that process. And you know, and there's a lot of, it's a, it's great, your description is great about how that can be a pipeline for setting the stage for some of these opportunities. So, all right, well, let's continue. So, you know, it's important to talk about the funding to this program, and you'll see that this is a funding partnership, which makes it very powerful as well. We have multiple funding sources here, so just briefly going down the list, um, AOT, we provide uh, up to $180,000 in funding, and that's via our FHWA, Federal Highway Administration, SPR, State Planning and Research Funds, and that's uh, about 80%. And that funding typically requires an 80-20 match. And so an 80-20 match on, you know, uh, it sometimes can be a bit difficult for municipalities to make that match. And that's where the genius of ACCD comes in with this, which is ACCD provides via their uh, municipal planning grant recapture funds 10% of that match. So as opposed to an 80-20 match for communities, this is an 80-10% match with that other 10% coming from ACCD. The idea being that we want to make sure that we decrease that barrier to entry to make sure that even the smallest of towns and villages have the opportunity to apply to this program and really think broadly about a grandiose vision for this program. Um, the third item you'll see here is ANR, so the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, and there's an asterisk, and I'll explain that in a second, but there's a clean water funding available. This funding is optional. That means that communities do not have to engage in clean water funding, uh, and that would be stormwater planning and stormwater master plans, which also create public space opportunities. That's a $30,000 slice that communities can take partake in, but they don't have to. So typically we see, for example, in this grant cycle, we have three communities, two of whom have gone for the entire $97,500 award, and one community went for the $67,500 award, instead neglect, uh, uh, choosing not to use a clean water funding. So that is an optional funding source that just gives a little more, let's say, it's a technical term, a little more oomph to the planning process, right? So. Um, that's the breakdown of the funding. Uh, you'll see here that we say that VDH in the past, an important part of this process, given that it's a lengthy planning process, is that people get planning fatigue after a while. And our communities, you know, just want to see the end game here, right? And so in the past, VDH was, uh, was able to provide up to, um, I believe, what, 30, grand. 30, 30 grand in funding for what we'll call implementation or demonstration projects. So the idea being that as ideas were turning during the planning process, um, funding would be available 
to Better Connections communities specifically to show a temporary implementation of that project, to show communities what they will be working towards. And so you'll see there's you know little Easter eggs along the way to encourage planning process and move people along as part of this broad, really interagency partnership to make sure that this planning is a success. And then just a plug at the bottom here, this program, given the funding source, is administered by VTrans, aka me. So I am responsible for reviewing the invoices and kind of just reviewing materials as well, along with Richard, to make sure that that is all okay. So um, I realize that's a lot for funding sources. If anybody has any questions about those, I'm happy to answer them. One thing that might be helpful for the CAR committee is it's like, where does it tie into our budget? Is it is it the policy and planning? Where does the, the 180 come from? That, that comes from the FHWA. And what? And yes, I understand yeah. that. But I mean, are you? Is your program considered part of program development? You know, or policy and planning? Where does it? Uh, this would be policy and planning. Right. Yes. Yeah. Just, just that's helpful for the committee to understand where that where that number shows up. Yes. Yeah. Representative Campbell. This is ninety seven. Point five million dollars per oh, oh, that's, that's a typo. That's yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was looking at that number today, and I was like, "Hey, there's something wrong about this." But that's really funny. Yeah, ninety-seven thousand five hundred. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> out of comma, but if you see all these projects yeah. happening all over this place, yeah. 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 So, I looked at this slide at least like yeah, I mean, five to ten times, and Richard did as well. And there's always one thing on a slide that uh, that pops up. There. That is indeed ninety-seven thousand five hundred dollars, not ninety-seven million. Our grantees would be thrilled to have that much. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, so moving on to the next slide, this is just to give an example of the clean water fund aspect of this. We talked about the transportation planning um, and the economic development planning, but like I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we like to see layers in the planning process. So the example I'd like to give um, from a stormwater standpoint and bringing this into the planning process that you can kind of see in this image here is that transportation space can also be public space that creates activity and community that also supports our environment. And so a neck down, a large you know, pedestrian island can also have green infrastructure, such as a rain garden in it that helps you know, uh, purify our waters, that also provides a safe pedestrian crossing, that also creates more public space, that also calms traffic in a downtown setting. So we get very excited about visions and plans that create these layers of different spaces that ultimately lead to a more vibrant downtown. So again, a, a big thank you and a big plug here for ANR for this clean water component because it really does help to empower the transportation planning and economic development side of what we do here. And then finally, th these are examples of what I alluded to previously, which were the quick build grants. Um, so you can see uh, examples of temporary lane markings to, you know, demonstrate to folks what it would be like to have a bike lane on a roadway or perhaps like a signage that would be like a low hanging fruit for an implementation side of whatever recommendations came out of a project or the park pocket park here, you know, to give it again another demonstration space that shows what is possible by the creation of a, like a, a community vision here. So this is the, you know, administered typically at the midway point or the two thirds point again to get communities activated to show them that they're almost there and then look what great things lie in store as we as you are being prepared to complete your vision, but then also prepare for applying to future funding sources as well. And so this is the by the numbers again, I'll, I'll let you take a look at the by the numbers on the side. I just want to before I, I pass this over to Richard, just tell you about our, our communities that are engaged in this cycle right now to give you an example of the type of planning processes that are happening. So we have three communities in the FY21 cycle, Bethel, Lindenville and Pulteney. So Bethel is focusing specifically on downtown accessibility. Uh, similar to Virgen's, uh, it's, well, they have lots of issues with grades of sidewalks and accessibility from storefronts at the street level up to and into the storefront. So uh, Bethel's vision was accessibility for all and trying to create a more pedestrian friendly and overall accessible space in their downtown area. So that's a, a great example of how you know, pedestrian accessibility creates economic development, it supports business and supports growth within a downtown. Lindenville is very interesting. Um, their work is focusing on consolidating the village center. They have almost an excess of what I would say is streetscape space in their area. And so, you know, there are trucks that typically pass through the town center. Um, it is a state route, it is a class one town highway as well, but 
there was just a lot of streetscape space, angle parking. And so anything that to reprogram that streetscape space and have that be different public space would ultimately help to empower and create new vitality in the downtown area, which is an important part of that project. And finally, Pulteney is town to trails. Pulteney has an interesting uh, setup where uh, right now Slate Valley is creating a series of uh, mountain bike trails about four miles away from the downtown, if I'm not mistaken. And so bridging that gap between the downtown um, and the, the Slate Valley trails is extremely important. So uh, this plan, uh, their plan is interesting because it focuses not just on that connection, but what that connection brings ultimately in terms of vitality and development to the downtown space via perhaps pocket, pocket parks or other activities that support that connectivity and allow pe give people a place to land in a downtown environment when they're done bike riding for the day. Who doesn't like a beer or something to drink after a big bike ride, right? So I think leveraging that, that intrinsic instinct of that, that kind of like a, a recreational culture, that's really the, the uh, purpose of the Pulteney study. So you'll see there are different flavors. Overall, the idea is regional amenities, connections to them that then bring them back, to, bring folks to downtowns and any kind of empowering public space activations within downtowns to support economic growth. And so now I will pass it over to Richard. <laughs> I ask a quick question about, about uh, Lindenville, just, um, or, or, or all of these, uh, what's the status of all these? These projects, uh, most of these projects are, they have completed their existing conditions. They are now within their planning or thinking ahead to their implementation process or implementation recommendations. So all of these studies will be completed by the end of the year. All of them were a bit delayed due to the kind of aftermath of COVID and just the slowness of the uh, the contract execution process. Okay. I would say. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Just let me know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I get to um, share um, the remarkable successes and impact the Better Connections Plan process at the local level at the community. It's been truly inspiring to see how communities have used better connections to really drive positive change. And one of the first projects we funded in 2014 was the Mad River Valley Active Transportation Plan. It was really developing a unified multi-town vision of how their um, transportation infrastructure could help strengthen the vitality of their village centers from more and more town to Waitsville to also use um, recreation connections to all the main beautiful assets they have. Um, and you can see here, like in the Blueberry Lake, cool part of this there's enough resources and funding to support really comprehensive in-depth studies and they even looked at um, looking at the economic impact of the recreational assets and looking at how that helps support the local economy so it's a really key component of these planning while you're looking at transportation and infrastructure improvements how those improvements can drive economic vitality in our community centers um, you know and i'm going to let you guys read this and um, it's remarkable what um, the Matter River Valley has done. And, and I don't know all these, so I'm going to look through some of my notes because it's just a long list. But the, Waitsfield has constructed sidewalks throughout their village on Bridge Street on the east and west side of Route 100 since this planning process. And they not only, not only did it just for you know pedestrian walkways, but they added amenities to it using brick pavers, um, ornamental lighting, street trees to really create that sense of place. Um, Warren did the same thing, and in their village, it's a much smaller, and it has more architects per capita than any other place in the state. So, <laughs> piazza in their village rather than yeah. a traditional sidewalk and, and street. So their street is all one level with a bunch of cobblestone pavers, and it's kind of this amorphous uh, pedestrian car space that slows people down as you enter the, the Mother Warren General Store. Um, it's done really well. They've tapped into the Downtown Transportation Fund, other uh, agency of transportation funding as well. Um, they've also got a, a one point uh, a grant from the Forest Parks and Rec to create a 1.4 mile trail around Blueberry Lake. Um, and then Mad River recently received a, over $400,000 Borat grant, Borat grant, Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative grant. Um, it was the largest grant ever given out in Borat's history to really create a recreational hub and welcome and visitor center in the valley to help connect visitors and locals to all these recreational assets. Because, um, you know, in Vermont, a lot of these places are hidden gems, and if you don't know about them, um, you can't access them. So this whole process was about mapping them, identifying them. And a key component of it also is they put up 46 signs and kiosks throughout the valley, letting folks know where these trails assets are and um, directing folks through it. Um, they've installed 47 total trailheads, 21 major, 32 minor. Uh, across the whole valley, which is, um, if you ever talk to Josh Schwartz, who's the executive director of the Mad River Valley Planning District, it, it is what it, his, his face lights up when he talks about these trail kiosks and the signage, and the community loves them. 
Um, another, uh, I think, poster child of Butter Connections is Springfield. Um, they were really looking at how they could improve their main street throughout the heart of the downtown, make it more pedestrian friendly, um, safer, um, as well as the calm traffic, and create opportunities like the Comcoo Falls Pocket Park on the, the Black River. Uh, and it has been the, the roadmap or the action plan that the town government has used to make these investments. Um, and Gary and I have gone down there to celebrate them. Early on, they were doing annual parties to celebrate their successes. Um, it inspired the voters to support a $100,000 bond or, uh, or ballot item to support $100,000 annually to support downtown revitalization initiatives. Um, and it's been incredible to see all the work they've done. You know, one of the thing, few things they've you know, done is the Compu Falls Park that Gary mentioned, which, um, well, I'll, I'll pause for a minute. Um, I do want to plug here because this process, or this planning process does really provide the resources to engage the community and build consensus and have those tough conversations about where you want to be as a community and provides the resources and human capital to make that so. But Comptu Falls is a beautiful park in the heart of the village that was identified during this Better Connections Plan and implemented through the Downtown Transportation Fund and then activated last summer to bring Vermonters together um, through Butter Places program to bring events and activity and cultural programming um, to bring folks together after two years of the pandemic and reconnect in the heart of the downtown. Um, they've made streetscape improvements um, and making safer pedestrian crossings, narrowing um, the sidewalks and crosswalk to be um, safer um, crosswalk crossings um, and more attractive. They've also are developing new wayfinding signage and then uh, a big win for them, they're um, getting their co-op moving into the heart of the downtown. Um, you know, a, a grocery store local co-op moving into um, an old uh, bank building, right, Gary? It was a people's bank. People's bank. bank. Previously a grocery yeah. IGA or something. And before Richard goes on with that, doors continue to open for them because literally last year, one of the first TAP grant applications I reviewed was for Springfield to build upon their Better Connections vision to do a road diet and roadway narrowing, as Richard mentioned, on a corridor entering the downtown area. So communities continue to leverage these this planning vision opportunity for additional grant opportunities in the future. So literally Springfield was awarded a TAP grant and one of the you know criteria that helped support that was the idea of this better connections vision driving some of that. So anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, just down the road from Springfield, Chester um, developed a, a, a village revitalization plan to really um, explore um, both village centers. Chester has like a village centers that kind of um, at two bookends of the village, you know, and one where the town hall is, one where the common is, if you know Chester. Um, and I just wanted to point out here, you know, this isn't just about creating places for, um, you know, transportation improvements. It's about creating places people want to be, places people want to get out of their cars and shop and spend money, connect with each other, and really um, add those amenities that make our places special. And you can see in these renderings here, you know, it's beyond the sidewalks, it's beyond the parking, it's adding the, the lighting, the um, ornamental lighting, the banners, the trees, the, the, the clock, you know, and all that kind of furniture and amenities along the streetscape that creates places that are where people want to gather and be, not a, a place where, um, that's just for cars. And um, it's remarkable to see um, Julie Hans and the folks down in Chester, Julie's their town manager uh, now, um, how they're using this just like Springfield as their action planning to help guide investment. Um, I emailed her um, last week to get a, a, an update in preparation for this committee, and she listed off about 20 different things. I'm not going to read through all those about what they've done, but they've created a pocket park at the end of School Street, looping that to a tr one and a half million up mile, 1.5 mile trail to connect a common to this pocket park. And they use ARPA funding to help implement that quicker than they thought. They're doing a scoping study for Church Street sidewalk project. They got a million, almost a million dollars from VTrans to do a, a one mile long sidewalk to connect those two, um, each of the two village centers. Um, they've got a park and ride grant to put behind the green so they can add an EV charging station and have additional parking in the heart of the village center. And the list just goes on. They're working on a wayfinding plan. They've done a historic walking tour. I could keep ramble on all the great things that are coming on in Chester. Um, so it's been really um, inspiring to watch how these small towns are using this planning process to drive change. You know, and then another project up in the Northeast Kingdom um, and Island Pond um, was looking at ways how they could um, improve their streetscape for safety, but also connect to their, their lakefront, the, the pond front, I guess you'd call it um, there. And um, they looked at wayfinding and signage, as well as infrastructure improvements. But one of the things I do want to highlight is, you know, there's resources provided through this grant to also test things in real time. So during the planning process, they were doing some community engagement at an event where they do um, Friday Night Lights 
at the bandstand right there on the lake. Um, they did a temporary demonstration showing what an arrow or crosswalk would look like. Putting it out there, they um, interviewed and um, surveyed folks who were using it to see if this was a, a good fit for the community. And it's a good way to test out an idea before you make a huge capital investment to make sure it's a good fit for the community and um, you don't have any conflict points with cars and, and pedestrians. Um, so there's a, a lot of uh, testing and demonstration projects as part of these uh, Better Connections projects. Um, and then in Windsor, they were looking at how um, to really connect uh, both sides of the tracks in Windsor. They've been doing a lot of redevelopment on, on one side of the tracks. And I just really put this in here to say, you know, these plans are focused on the downtowns, but a big part of Windsor's was also looking at this kind of working class neighborhood um, right adjacent to the downtown, uh, nestled up against the Connecticut River, and how to improve the vitality and pedestrian safety of this um, working um, neighborhood, which used to um, uh, has one of the largest collections of kind of factory homes um, in the state. Uh, it, it's never gone down there. It's worth seeing. They've actually elevated a couple of them to get them out of the floodplain and use some clever funding from our shop to look at how you can elevate these small 1200 foot homes. Um, and then another project in Northwest Vermont, Enosburg, um, you know, it was a little bit of hard times and they really needed to bring the community together about a vision for their downtown. Um, and this quote, just um, if anybody knows Jim Cameron up in the Northwest, he's a businessman, he, he's a, you know, a straight shooter, he wants to get down to business, make things happen in this community. And you know, this planning process, I would never thought he would be the person to engage in it, but he was the driving force behind it. And he was, you know, as he said, got people together in the room and they made a plan and they're chipping away at making improvements into Enosburg Village. Um, and as Matthew mentioned, uh, our current round, just to share some of the more conversations that we're hearing late, um, a lot of communities are really exploring accessibility and how to make sure these improvements are um, serving the most vulnerable Vermonters. And um, Bethel is doing a great job of that. They're the first better connection plan that did an accessibility audit of public and private buildings and identified recommendations to make those buildings accessible for the community. And then as we saw from the very beginning with Mad River Valley, and now we're seeing with Pulteney, a lot of these have connections to our biggest asset in our community, our recreational and trails. And Pulteney is doing a great job connecting their downtown to the recreational amenities and they're wrapping up their process now. Um, I think that's all we have. We did put our um, contact information here. Um, we do have links as well to our program and we have a, a nice story map that highlights all these 18 projects and you can see the reports and their studies. Um, and then I'll close with, you know, developments happen incrementally, but great communities happen strategically, and that's what Better Connections can do. Yeah. Any questions? Community that was a lot. Questions? Oh, that was a nice slide to end on. There we go. Um, Scott? Yeah, I'm wondering about um, relocating traffic. And, um, so either closing off the street to make it a pedestrian uh, street um, or, or, or just rerouting, rerouting traffic so that there's, um, so there's less traffic on the, on the main street or the port, or whatever the shopping street is. Is that something that, you, that is also, you know, can be considered or, you know? Yeah, there are a lot of factors that need to be taken into consideration, but broadly speaking, yes. I mean, certainly thinking about if that empowers downtown development and street life, certainly. I mean, that's a conversation with the community for sure and a yeah. conversation with VTrans and, you know, our traffic engineers. But, you know, typically what Richard and I like to say is, you know, we we love to solve for yes. Give us a, we tell all our communities we love to solve for yes. Give us a heads up earlier on if you have bigger bite ideas like that, because mm -hmm. that'll give us the time we need within our agencies to socialize those ideas, talk with our engineers, understand if there's any kind of like red flags that go up immediately and kind of find that in between space to make those things possible. So um, short answer, that was a long answer to your question, but the short answer is it's complicated, but yes, that's certainly <laughs> something that would be within the realm of this possibility here. And I would add a lot of the, uh, recommendations coming out it's more about slowing traffic making more pedestrian space making it safer than rather getting cars out of our downtowns because yeah. uh, history has shown us if you completely remove cars from streets a lot of times it kills the vitality of our downtown there's only a handful of successful pedestrian malls like church street across the country there were hundreds of them in the 70s and 80s they've all reverted back to it because unless you have a, a highly um, tourism area, a college town, all the kind of trifecta that Burling has to make it successful. It's really hard to have a successful 
um, downtown that's just pedestrian oriented. So accommodating cars, but creating more of an equal landscape between pedestrian realm and um, automobiles is kind of what Better Connections does rather than giving the most of the landscape to cars, creating more opportunity for pedestrians in those spaces. Okay, great, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. So, Representative Lally, I have a big white um, suggestion for you. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm very familiar with the, the village core of Warren um, and one of the challenges um, it, with that remarkable place, if I encourage everybody to go visit it, is it's a class two um, highway. So it's impossible under current rules really to do that, it's my understanding. Um, and maybe that maybe there's more opportunity if you have a class one high, highway status. But anyway, this just kind of creates a, a sort of a barrier to doing some of these extraordinary things that you're um, depicting in here. Mm -hmm. And so um, if there could be, you know, some investigation with this update of the standards to uh, come up with greater flexibility so that we can kind of coordinate the placemaking and all of these fabulous goals with what you're actually able to do in most of Vermont, which is, you know, honestly has um, state highways running, is the village main street. Um, and, um, you know, and there's, for a variety of reasons, a, a trend towards not adopting <laughs> uh, class one. So the more we can figure out a way to sort of have more flexibility, I think, the more we can start to do more of this more easily. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's that's the big bite I would suggest. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree. And some of these um, communities that have used Better Connections do a class one analysis. And what would be the cost benefit of mm -hmm. taking it over to a class one as part of the, the street that goes through the village? And they've explored that in the financial you know, calculations of that. And some of them are moving in that direction. So they have more design flexibility to create the streetscape that aligns with more local priorities and then being a state highway. It's a very hard sell as someone who's yeah. tried to um, make is. that sell in, in, as a select board member in her own community. So, um, so anyway, in, in the meantime, if, if there could be ways to um, uh, just uh, pursue a little more flexibility, um, that, that would be wonderful. I totally agree. And the upcoming um, redo of the Vermont State Design Standards that V-Trans is leading, and Matthew probably knows more about than I, um, which has been budgeted for last year and I think coming through this year as well, that's a huge opportunity to revisit the design standards that are now probably 30 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that it could be really helpful. We are going to be here, that is in, um, we're going to be hearing some testimony next week about the, um, to get an update. and. And I think in one of the bills that uh, we've had a walk through on at H101, there's a there's um, a portion of that bill that um, addresses Vermont state standards. So I think to Representative Lally's point, I mean, I think a lot of us in communities where a lot of our downtowns are on state highway. I mean, you know, there are so many of them, Route 5, you know, that runs up and down um, the, the Connecticut River corridor. So, you know, if there, if the if you and your program have some perspective on that, that I think I would welcome that um, feedback on what what you're experiencing. I mean, we're going to be hearing from AOT uh, folks, so I think that would be um, that'd be helpful in our work for sure. You guys are hearing from Kelly and other folks on Complete Street. Yeah, to, that's to later to after lunch, and uh, and um, yeah, so we'll be here. Yeah, things are definitely strategically converging right now towards that. You know, with the the standards you mentioned, Complete Streets. You know, certainly the agency thinking about class one town highway program, what that might look like in the future. Like there are all these different opportunities right now that I think things are converging on the idea of like, we need to make this easier for folks. So, you know, just to plug that, I think strategically more and more, this is becoming the right time to address it because our downtowns internally, we all deserve this, right? Like it's a, it's crazy to pay $2,000, $5,000 for a plane ticket to Italy and think that that's something that's so far away when like we can have some of the public space and village amenities in our smaller towns here as well that like that mirror that kind of more European town feel and uh, from an American style of course as well but uh, you know that's why this program is really near and dear to my heart just because I just did also uh, just you know just some personal information I did my, my master's in Italy I was there for two years um, and so just I always ask why can't we have this here as well and so <laughs> I want to solve that so that's you're in the right place right? and, yeah. and we're both Italian sitting up at the front and we're both Italian <laughs> sitting up at the front of the <laughs> So, yeah. I, I would say that with you know the housing discussions that are going on and the growing impetus to recognize the value of our existing centers and 
um, create them as places capable of supporting this housing. There's like a huge, I mean, talk about convergence, you know, there's like mm -hmm. some real nice synergy happening. So, um, yeah. Huge opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to, dodge, yeah. in, in general, um, uh, how, how does, how does, how can this work um, connect in like the suburb, you know, there aren't very many suburban, you know, regions in the state, but if there are a few, and obviously if we're trying to reduce, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and promote equity and all of that, like how, how did, how do these principles um, and, <clears throat> and actors in our state, you know, agencies interact with more suburban communities in the yep. state? And, yeah. and how do we encourage more of that? No, I think that it's the idea of in suburban, Vermont is very well suited, I would say, even in suburban context to get folks out of cars and think about multimodal connectivity because there is a certain amount of compactness to our suburban areas being relatively close to some sort of commercial center or downtown center. So from my standpoint, and I grew up in a suburban area, I grew up in suburban Long Island, which had a similar, let's say, suburban DNA of like town center or suburban expanse, but everything was kind of still compact and walkable to a certain degree. So I think in a suburban area, it comes down to sidewalk connectivity, making sure that pedestrians can get from point A to point B, what regional bike and other trail networks can do to bring people to downtown areas, because oftentimes that bike distance may be only 10 minutes, right? And that, that it's very easy for people, you know, not everybody, obviously, just from an equity standpoint, but that's very, that creates other layers of accessibility. So I think it starts with just encouraging that multimodal from like a trails standpoint and from a sidewalk standpoint and then thinking about consolidating you know whatever existing now I'm wearing richard's hat more and we do this all the time where we pass off our hats to each other but you know many of those suburban shopping centers just with a i think rethinking um land use could be inverted to have proper street frontages and create more of a downtown feel that is more accessible so i'm reminded of a my uh, my colleague was here last week, Karen Sentoff, when she was we were talking about her family actually, and they live in the new north end of Burlington. And she said her parents are retirees; they moved here from Syracuse. And what they love is that you know, even though they're in the new north end, they don't need a car because that's that kind of like suburban Vermont style of suburbs. That still, her father can ride his bike to get to the main shopping center that has a brewery that has a supermarket that has a pharmacy and a few of the other things there. So I think it starts with those connectivity and using those 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 commercial centers that exist in that suburban areas as starting off points to to move people to them. So it works. It works both in suburban areas, I would say. I would say also better connections can support corridor planning and, and um, areas that are outside the downtown. We have supported a project in Rutland Town and West Rutland. They joined together to look at the Route 4 corridor and make that more pedestrian and bike friendly. Um, so there is opportunity to use better connections to look at more linear, more, you know, kind of suburban um, roadways to make them more bike friendly. And then the work that South Burlington doing at the city center is an amazing example of what, you know, suburban towns are doing to really create walk Walkable community centers, the opportunity that lies in front of Essex experience, and I know you're probably involved in out in Essex, the reimagining of that you know shopping plaza to be a place to, for the community to gather is huge. And then here closer to Montpelier, the uh, Berlin Shopping Center is now a new town center, and they're thinking about how to create that as more of a uh, a new modern downtown. And they actually reached out to us this round for a better connections grant to improve some bike pedestrian connections as well. So. To the both of you, uh, how do you, what do you when you're talking about you know, something that you know, Representative Lawley was just talking about, lowering the speed limits, that type of thing, in, in, in some uh, suburban or rural uh, villages? Most of our rural villages, from my perspective, is just some place that people have to go through to get where they really want to go. So, uh, you know, putting the hook out for some of the work maybe that would like to show down in Chester, maybe get them to slow down just naturally going through there and want to stop. But how do you balance drivable versus walkable versus usable uh, space in, 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 in these communities? You know, where, where, where is the balance? I think like your rural village example is really interesting because I just think, you know, north of the border in Quebec, right? There are some like really small villages, Vermont style villages that there's almost a pattern that you see where there is some sort of gateway treatment or totem 
some sort of signage, gateway treatment about like a half mile to a mile outside the town that says that you're passing from like the, the rural highway space towards like more of a village center. So I think it's a combination of visual signals to delineate as you approach the town center and then just where you expect there to be more pedestrians, ensuring that there is pedestrian space available and that also speed limits are lower, right? So I think it's the signaling of a transition plus empowering those downtown spaces by just making sure that there's those basic pedestrian amenities and creating a space for each person in that roadway space. And so oftentimes there's a lot of roadway space to work with. Certainly again, thinking about Lindenville, you know, there is a lot of angle parking and just overall, you can even see it from satellite photos. It looks, the, the gray of the park pavement looks lighter than other parts because it's just not as driven over as much. So that creates a space opportunity there to adjust and empower and create more of a downtown character. So I think it's signaling at a transition area plus pedestrian amenities within that immediate village um, just to make sure that pedestrians are safe relative to the passage of vehicles. And that those two factors alone create a lot of opportunity there. Good. Well, I'm sorry, Richard. Okay. I was just saying a good opportunity or an example of that is what Michelle and Amy shared earlier in Danville along Route 2. They really have gateway treatments um, with different kind of paving. Route 2 is a highly trafficked corridor, right, with truck traffic and lots of cars connecting central Vermont to St. Jay. Um, but Danville really hit the ball out of the park with like gateway treatments, pedestrian infrastructure in the heart of the village, redoing the village green. And it may add 30 seconds to your commute, but it causes you to slow down just enough to make it safer for pedestrians. Also in villages, there's a lot of driveways because houses are closer together. There's general stores. There's not a lot of delineation of that, where you go in the park. So um, there's conflict points. So you want cars to slow down in these areas, even if it adds a minute to some of these commuter passing through for safety reasons. And then when they slow down, they actually may see, hey, look, that general store's got ice cream. I want to stop and buy some because cars don't spend money, people spend money. And so it's the kind of cost benefit of uh, adding a little bit of time for your commute to supporting the vitality and safety of our community. And then you mentioned uh, the West Rutland Rutland Town Corridor. Uh, it's That's a, for the communities, that, that's a four lane highway. Mm -hmm. And with, with wide bike, bike paths. And it's a forty or forty. It's a forty mile an hour speed limit, which makes it a fifty mile an hour road. <laughs> and and uh, such traffic signals, but uh, they do they coexist at those speeds because of the construction of the highway. Uh, basically, a place where people can walk and, and, and bike and not be really conflicted with, uh, with with traffic. So that's a, kind of a success story. They would try to try to road diet, and that was. <laughs> Was, didn't go well. Politically, that didn't go well. Yeah. <laughs> Never goes well. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, and then you talk to this, this approach. Brandon had a huge project that went through their town. Mm, yeah. Thirty million dollar rebuild of the highway through through the middle of town. And their success story: they took traffic away from the storefronts in some areas and built, you know, uh, a walkable space. But it's thirty million dollars. And so how does a how does a town do that with your typical town? It does this not gonna happen? So how do we I'm sure you can see, how do we make that happen on a smaller scale? I think I think it's a uh, you know what Bethel has been really good at with this grantee cycle in, in particular is the prioritization of projects to implement, right? So they they have their idea now, right? Like we need a kind of ADA accessible sidewalks, but they have a few other ideas as well. And you know the town only has a certain amount of money in their coffers. And so the the, the idea of dedicating planning time and space and really thinking about the prioritization of those projects and tracking that those priorities to individual grant opportunities or funding sources that you know are also made available. We provide that technical assistance at the, the tail end of the project too. Hey, you might want this this tracks directly to a TAP grant, or this would be suitable for a downtown transportation fund grant. And so making sure that little by little, each of those project components are uh, smaller bites that can be chipped away at, and then there's a prioritization for those smaller bites. So I think it's the helping with the prioritization that really um, uh, is what helps make these better connection program projects. I'm guessing you make all your out outreach through the RPCs. Uh, by a large majority, or do you, your shops actually reach out to the communities? We have direct relationship with the communities through the village center designation and the downtown program. 
Um, and we work closely with the RPCs and Vermont League of Cities attack, like all the, the known suspects that play in this space. We um, rely on them to get the word out to these grant opportunities and connect with us for sure. For example, Devin Neary is the, the local project manager yeah, we for the we, for Pulteney. The delegation met with Devin this morning. So. Yeah, so he's the local project manager for right. Pulteney. So, right. like that, so that's RPC direct involvement. And sometimes RPCs can just provide technical assistance instead. So that's really up to them to work out with the grantee communities. But it's really us working directly with the communities, looping in the RPCs and any number of other like independent organizations or agency resources that are required to make these things uh, make these things a reality. I will I will add though, like in Brandon's case, you know, they had a once in a lifetime opportunity we did. Be, you know, doing a route seven in that segment and they took advantage of it and made a great place. Waterbury's done the same thing recently with route, you know, two going through and creating, you know, that opportunity. Barry did it about a decade ago, I guess, with a big dig. So, you know, taking advantage of those huge opportunities when you do have an inclusion of federal state funds and make that happen. But then also being strategic about incrementally chewing uh, you know, chipping away at things like for gens, like Gary mentioned, like you know raising the sidewalks up, making it accessible to business, and coming through five, 10 years of grant funding and just incrementally chipping away to make that space better for pedestrians and people. Um, so there's kind of multiple approaches to, to get to um, the, create the places that we want to be. And it's important to have a plan, I would say, ultimately, because when those $30 million projects do come up, it's very easy to just hand that to the VTrans project manager and say, hey, we have a plan here. What can you chip away at as part of your larger project and reconstruction project. So, you know, there are multiple mechanisms within VTrans to consider and incorporate existing town plans or visions into larger, larger repaving and roadway reconstruction projects. We have a whole uh, program called quarter planning in particular that focuses on this. What are the existing villages, or excuse me, what are the existing visions within a community and how can those visions and uh, needs and desires be plugged into a, a wider corridor reconstruction project or repaving project. So having a plan is really great to be able to plug into other plans, which is one of the, uh, you know, the genius, uh, the genius uh, aspects of this Better Connections program as well, I would say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Molly. Um, getting back to sort of speaking of the conflict, you know, between what you're doing and what might happen, you know, according to these trans standards. And we have a um, representative, I was interested in the Med River Valley project, because a representative from Waitsfield has a bill here, H100, that is um, to address pedestrian safety, traffic calming, crosswalks, et cetera. And it was to allow municipalities to seasonally install in-street pedestrian crossing signs, crosswalks. And I don't know, for some reason, there was a, con you know, there was a, a uh, an accident there and that she was not allowed to, they were not allowed to do this. And um, also in allowing municipalities to lower speed limits on state highways and express the General Assembly's intent that the traffic committee should not increase the speed limit on the state highway in response to municipalities request that the speed limit be lowered. So I just see those as conflicts between what, you know, you're trying to do, you know, the, the problems that she's encountered and what, and so where is that like the communication that you have, or is this going to be solved better with the state standards the revision? I don't know. I'm just trying to find out how those conflicts might get um, managed. So those conflicts are managed in better connections just by uh, frequent review, I would say. And so rather than coming with a final plan to our engineers to say, hey, is this feasible? What happens is throughout the planning process, I go to our engineers and relevant divisions and say, look, this is what the community is proposing so far. What do you think, right? What's your feedback on this? And so I think uh, to the conflict is mitigated by early involvement, at least within the cadre of better connections um, uh, and within within AOT specifically. Uh, you know, there are also other mechanisms to, to help communities think about this. My colleague who was just here before, Jackie Dement, you know, she talked about art in the right of way, but I don't think she was here to talk about demonstration projects, which is another program that she manages, which allows communities within the state of right of way to create temporary installations to demonstrate what a crosswalk or what something would be feasible, right? And so there's a there is an opportunity there as well. So I think, you know, the standards is certainly like the big bite. And then within the program itself, better connection specifically is early involvement. And then 
uh, you know, there are other mechanisms within VTrans to just think about uh, temporary installations to demonstrate the necessity of a specific crosswalk or pedestrian space to, to what you're alluding to. Maybe she can talk to Jackie, you know, that rather than going to legislatively. Yeah, I think that would be great. Yeah. That's great. So we're, this has been really great, the, the series of presentations that we've received this morning. And so and we're at time. I think we could we would enjoy having continued conversations with you. But this is we, our time. <laughs> must end. So, yeah. And thank you for for um, for sharing uh, all this and also just the, the various projects happening around the state. It helps really for members of the, myself, for members of the community, I'm sure, just to see how these kinds of um, programs and projects and planning can really, you know, you know, they're really proof of the, the work that you're doing. So I want to thank you for your work and thanks for coming in here. Thanks. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for all your support. Yeah. Right. Thank you. All right. And with that committee, I think we are due back here at one o'clock. So